Ecclesiastes chapter number 1. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 2, and then we're going to skip down a few verses. The Bible says, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? Now, skip down to verse number 8. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Now, those of you that are students of your Bibles know that Ecclesiastes means the preacher, and that if you study out the book of Ecclesiastes, you find out that the preacher, who was the king of David, or the son of David and king of Jerusalem, that'd be Solomon. So Solomon, writing a, for lack of a better term, a message, right, or a sermon to the people of Israel. It starts off in verse number 2. It says, vanity of vanities. It says that twice. All is vanity. Now, vanity in your Bible means emptiness, hollowness, the inability to satisfy, right? There's nothing to it. Okay, it's a whole lot like Chinese food. I like Chinese food. But I can get full on Chinese food, and then 30 minutes after I finish eating, I'm hungry again. That it is vanity. Okay, that's why you got to get Japanese food where they load you up. Okay, a lot less rice, a whole lot more meat. Okay, sometimes that meat sushi, and I know that's not for everybody, but it's good stuff. Okay, but vanity doesn't satisfy. Vanity is something that appears to have value on the outside, but once you receive it, you find out that. It's junk, right? I mean, I remember a few years ago, probably over a decade ago now, but there was one of those quote-unquote Fabergé eggs that was going up for auction. They claimed it had been in private ownership since it had been made, and they had all the provenance. There was just one problem. It wasn't real. It was a fake. It was a real good fake, and it was a really old, really good fake, but it wasn't a real deal. Somebody had something that they thought had value until somebody burst their bubble and said, this isn't what you think it is. Well, here the preacher says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Then he goes on, verse number three, he says, what profit hath a man of all his labor, which he taketh under the sun? Now that word labor, okay, it, by definition, labor means work that will tire you out. In fact, Webster uses the word exceedingly tiring work. Right? It's the labor is the kind of work that you do that when you're done with it, all you want to do is go to bed. All you have left is the energy to get back to where it is that you need to go to, pass out, wake up, and do it again. Right? Because the Bible uses a lot of different words for what we would assume work nowadays. There's labor, there's work, there's a burden, there's that which you toil in, right? You could plant, and then we all know that whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. There are a lot of different words that the Bible uses for things that people do. But in this context, it's referring to those things that people desire something so much that they will absolutely work themselves to the bone to get it. Right? They have a desire in their life that is so valuable to them that they're willing to give up everything in pursuit of it so that by the time they're done laboring for it they've got nothing left in the tank and we all know life isn't well I want it I mean even today with the internet and Amazon right down the road you order something you still got to wait at least two days right to get it from Amazon Prime right as much as the world is so much more things are right here we know that life, right? I could, I'd have to start saving a whole long time to get that Aston Martin that I talk about every now and then, right? That's not going to happen overnight unless I go steal it, okay? Which isn't going to happen because there's not an Aston Martin dealership around here. But anyway, right? Labor gives the context that you wear yourself out day after day after day in pursuit of something. Well, what's that thing that you're pursuing? Well, according to verse number two, it's vanity. 
You're killing yourself physically, mentally, emotionally to obtain something that will not satisfy you. That's why he says vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Because you go read the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon lived a long life. God gave him a lot of wisdom. And as a result, he said he studied everything in the course of the world. And he says everything that man labors for isn't going to satisfy him. We're going to get to a few of them things. But down in verse number 8, he says, All things are full of labor. All the desires of this world, since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, anything outside of God, all those desires, all those wishes, all those things that we endeavor for, they're full of labor. Right? Some things in life are worth having, but if it's worth having, it means you've got to work for it. Because the things that are worth having are worth working for. If it wasn't worth working for, you don't need it. Right? But it says all things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That it that he's talking about, man cannot utter it, man can't see it, man can't hear it. What he's talking about is you can look all across the world. There have been a lot of famous poets, a lot of famous playwrights that have written down great and some would say lovely descriptions of the handiwork of God. But any desire that you can find on the earth outside of God, not going to satisfy you. What's that it that he's talking about in verse number 8? Man can't come up with words that are going to satisfy that hole in your soul. You're not going to see something one day that's so beautiful that it's going to satisfy that aching deep down in your soul. No matter how much you consume, no matter how much you listen to, you know, all them now used to is books on tape. Now they're, then there were books on CD, now it's audio books that you just download to your phone. There ain't enough chicken soup for the whatever soul self-help books that are going to fill that desire which is deep down in man. That it is that longing to have the separation between man and God mended. You know why man labors? Because they know they're missing something. They think they figure it out and they'll kill themselves trying to get it only to realize it wasn't what they were hoping it was going to be. There are people that travel the world hoping to find, you know, the seven wonders of the world or trying to find the most pristine and beautiful places in nature. And once they get there, guess what? It doesn't fill that hole in their soul. And you say, well, how do you know that, Brother Jordan? Because they take another trip. If they satisfied, they wouldn't take another trip. Doesn't matter how many you know how much entertainment or how much of a cell phone screen or how much of social interaction there's no hearing right there's not something one day that you're going to hear that just all of a sudden satisfies you in this world it goes on to say verse number nine the thing that hath been is that which which shall be and that which is done is that which shall be done and there is no new thing under the sun nowadays we got different means of doing it but you know what the motivations of man today are? The same that they were in the beginning. You know what the essence of sin is today? The same that it was back then. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. You know why men fought wars back in the olden days? Same reason people fight wars nowadays. You know why people are so easily corrupted today? Because they're just as greedy as they were back then. There's a different name to it. The places may have changed names. The people or the, the characters in the play may have been swapped out. But you can look at the world today and compare it to the world of the Old Testament and the Bible and people's motivations are the same. There are Christians that sell God out for a whole lot less than 30 pieces of silver. There are people that disobey God for a whole lot less than some Babylonian gold or a wedge of gold in a Babylonian garment that Achan hid in his tent. There are people that are still today afraid of 
the God on the mountain and try to craft themselves their own idol, just like in Moses' day. The motivations of man, the desires of man have not changed. We're very simple creatures. People say that we're all individuals because God made us each different. But when you really boil us down, we're real simple. We like doing things for ourselves that make us happy. And most of the time, the only time that people do things for other people is because either they get something out of it, like a tax break, or it's because seeing somebody else happy makes them happy. That like Christmas time comes around, there's a whole lot of people in the world that one set of grandparents is out trying to give the other set of grandparents because they want the grandkid to think that they're the best grandparents. Or there's one divorced parent pit against another divorced parent on trying to have the kid. Why? Because having the kid makes them happy. And from working in a law office for 10 years, worked, for, worked with a guy, didn't work directly for him, but his name's Mike McMain, good guy. Mike once told me, he said, Jordan, divorce is the craziest thing I've ever seen. People will spend $50,000 arguing over $5,000 worth of stuff just because they want the other person to be wrong. It's not worth it in the end, but why? It's to fill that pride deep down in here. They think that if they can get a judge to say the other person was wrong, that it'll justify them deep down in here. That it'll fill that hole. But guess what it all boils down to? Nothing out there in that world has ever satisfied, nor will it ever. It's incapable of it. Doesn't matter what you say, doesn't matter what you see, doesn't matter what you hear. It's all vanity. You know what the world likes to talk about? How great the world is. But you know what happens every time somebody goes out there to try and test, to prove what the world has to offer? It's empty. Don't satisfy. It looks like it's gold on the outside, but it's just tinfoil that they wrapped over a piece of chocolate. It's not real. From a distance away, they might be able to fool you, but once you're in it, you realize it's counterfeit. Doesn't satisfy. Well, so I was reading these verses. Another passage came to mind. The reason we didn't turn there and read that today is because you all know it, because I quoted about 800 times a lesson. Right? We know that the Bible teaches that godliness with contentment is great gain. Notice that verse doesn't say that contentment is great gain, Ms. Billy doesn't say that contentment is the goal. It says godliness with contentment. If you have godliness but you have a desire for things that aren't of God, you're not godly. But if you have godliness and you're content with it, there's great gain in it. You know what the world has? A whole lot of non-commit or contentment. They have discontent. They have those things that once you have this, well then, you know how that made you happy for a little bit? If you work a little bit harder, you can have this next thing which will make you happy for twice as long. Not permanently, but twice as long as the last thing. Or well, the, the reason that this didn't make, it's because what I really want is that. And this is a stepping stone to get there. Right? The excuses and the lies and the Really, the brainwashing from the beginning of the world is the same thing that the serpent told Eve in the garden. That you will become as gods. Lowercase g. Man wants to be the ruler of his own destiny. Man wants to be able to have the power over what happens in his life and he'll do anything to get it. Only problem is he'll never have it. He'll never attain to what he aspires to. So what's the alternative? I know that the world, there's nothing out there, we're going to read those verses in between what we just read a minute ago. But if the goal is godliness with contentment, you know why the world, from sun up to sundown each and every day, is doing the same things that the generation before did? Trying the same thing over and over, but trying to get a different outcome? They're doing it because they're not content. They have no peace. They have no satisfaction. They have no deep down solid belief 
that if they lost everything, it'd still be okay. They have no assurance. Why do you think that the songwriter said, blessed assurance? It's not just that we have assurance. The assurance that we have is a great blessing. Because I know, no matter what, come what may, he promised he'll never leave me nor forsake me. He promised that when it gets too big for me, the arm of flesh will fail you. But I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. All those things that the world fears, Christ takes care of. He made me a joint heir. What are you saying about it? And that's on count for many blessings. He's, made, he's promised me a fortune greater than anything that this world has to offer. Everything that he owns, I own. In God's eyes, I'm just the same as the son. When he looks at me, he sees his son. I have the assurance that heaven and earth can pass away, but this word that I've staked my faith on, it will not pass away. What's the world really want? They want what a saved Christian has. They want peace. They want security. They want fellowship with the Almighty. They may not understand that, but that hole deep down in their soul is because their soul knows that God made them. God breathed into man the breath of life. The soul of man knows there is a God because that's where it came from. And every day separated from God is a pain to our souls. Is it any wonder that God went to the lengths that He did to offer us salvation when after we get saved, the Bible says that He turned some over to the destruction of the flesh that the soul might be saved. God intended that soul to be in perfect fellowship with Him. And seeing a soul tormented by sin, separated from the one that gave it life, it moved the heart of God. Well, the danger is that if we have a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof, if we think ourselves to be godly and we lose that contentment, we're liable to vex our own souls, searching after things in the world. Because we know we have God, but we're not satisfied. Well, why is that? It's not God's problem. That's a me problem. That's an I problem. Most of the time, it's a pride problem. Sometimes it's just an ignorance problem. You know why you should count your many blessings? Because first off, after you get through about a page of them, right, you're going to be hooping and hollering or crying or shouting or doing something. But then, once you get the list finished, and then you have to keep adding to it each and every day, those days that the devil comes up next to you and says, living for God isn't worth it, no, you haven't seen my list of blessings. I've been blessed above all measure. You know what that means? You can't find a scale. You can't find a list. You can't find something to compare to that will give you an idea of how blessed I really am. You know why Christians aren't content, even though the God of the Bible is still the same God that we have today? It's because Christians have gotten their eyes off of our mark, which is, you know, having our eyes pointed to our Lord Jesus, looking unto Jesus, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And instead of being satisfied with what we have, we see all the material things that we don't have. Well, did not God promise that seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added unto you? So either my seeking it and right, because I'm not seeking first the kingdom of heaven, or else God would give me all that I can have without falling out of living a life that's up to His approval. God won't give me something that He knows is going to tempt me to get out of the life. Right, so either my seeking wrong or my satisfaction wrong. You can have your eyes on Jesus and get so jaded and cold and backslid that you see Jesus, but He doesn't mean what He should mean to you. Again, that's a me problem. Something has crept in. There's bitterness, there's envy. 
there's a lack of fellowship between me and the Lord. Something has entered into my life that has caused the visage of God in my life to become blurred or marred. There's something between me and God preventing me from being satisfied with having Him. Well, let's take a look at verse number 4. It says, One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. What does that mean? Well, it means what he said down in verse number 9, and there is no new thing under the sun. As long as this earth keeps spinning till the Lord comes back in the next dispensation called the tribulation period, comes to fruition, everything on this earth will be as it has been since Adam and Eve sinned. Right? It says one generation path and another generation. How many generations have there been between us and Adam? Bunch. But through all them generations, what caused Cain to kill Abel? Same reason that people kill people today. Jealousy, embarrassment, rage, envy. Right? Those, whether it's premeditated or whether it's you know, one of those crimes of passions. You know why people do things today? Same reason they've been doing them since the beginning. Because the world hadn't changed. The earth abideth forever. God set it out here and He said until He destroys it with fire, it's going to be there. And when sin entered into the world, sin corrupted the whole world. It's just as corrupt today as it was back then. Because sin is sin. There is no degree of sin. There is just sin. The earth abideth forever. Mankind doesn't. And man's too stupid to realize that the lessons the last generation learned are important to remember. The last generation just keeps teaching the next generation that if you labor harder, if you kill yourself a little bit more, you'll be able to have what I didn't have. Hogwash. Right. I mean, I found out the other day, y'all know that tallest building in the world over there in Dubai? That Burj Khalifa, I think is what it's called. That stupid building, they've lost so much money on it. But you know why they did it? They knew they were going to lose money on it. They knew that they were going to put more into it than they would be able to recoup out of it. It was all about prestige. I think they said they broke some like 50 world records when they built that building. And they did it to show that, you know, Dubai and Abu Dhabi and all those, you know, Middle Eastern places, they're so much better than the rest of the world. Last I checked, you're still in a desert. I got water outside. It's a little bit frozen this morning, but it's still out there. I'd take water over tallest building any day. But it was all about prestige. We're better than you. Why did the people try to build the Tower of Babel? Because they thought that they could become gods by ascending into the heavens. God said, you're dumb. Right? If it was going to come to not, God would have let them build it until it fell over. But your Bible says that God saw that their methods or their foundation were strong, meaning that they was going to build it. They couldn't have got to heaven, but they'd have run out of oxygen. Higher up you go, the harder it is to breathe. Higher up you build, the more effort it takes to take those things up there. People would have been dying trying to get them bricks to the top of that tower. You say, how do you know that? Because people die trying to climb Mount Everest every year. In fact, so many people have died trying to climb Mount Everest. They use the frozen dead bodies as markers on the trail telling you where to go. Because they're so high up there and it'd be so hard to go up there and reclaim their body. They just leave them there. You say, what are they trying to do? Same thing that the people at the Tower of Babel were doing. Look what I did. I did something you didn't do. The earth abideth forever and all the folly that comes with it. You know why all those monuments originally were built in Washington, D.C.? 
so that you would ooh and ah at it and remember the people that they were dedicated to. Right? I don't think it's any strange coincidence that all the capitals around the world, all those buildings look real nice. Why? Because they want people to be impressed. You know who I'd be impressed with? Somebody that said, hey, just give us like a lean-to over yonder. We shouldn't be working in there anyway. We should be out helping people. And they just put a sign on the door that says, sorry, if we're not here, come back later. I'd be impressed with them people if they was like, I don't care about our office space. Give that money back to the people. I'd be impressed with that. I'm not impressed with marble and big Corinthian columns and domes that have, you know, great murals and paintings on them. Doesn't impress me. Why? Because it's all been done before. Every now and then, brother Ed, I walk into one of them places and I think, still, about a drop in the bucket to Solomon's Temple. That's the greatest edifice that man ever built. And guess what happened to it? It was torn down. Guess what's going to happen to every Capitol building one day, sooner or later? It's going to be torn down. If it isn't torn down, it's going to be melted with a fervent heat one day. Now, God blessed it. You know, they were to use those gifts and that ability to bring honor and glory to God with it. Hallelujah. But a lot of it's vanity. Well, well. Verse number five, it says, The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteneth to his place where he arose. Doesn't matter how long, how hard, how much money you give in pursuit of trying to make a day last longer, you can't. Trying to make a year pass quicker or slower than what it does, not going to happen. Doesn't matter how many facelifts they give you, your face is just going to become more stretched out. Okay, instead of looking slightly younger, you're just going to look like a lizard. Okay? Like, I don't understand why somebody would go through. Can't you look at the people that had it and realize they still haven't figured it out yet? Like, why sign me up for the thing that they haven't worked out yet? No, thank you. Do not want to be a guinea pig. What are you saying, brother? There's a lot of people that try to make life last, last a whole lot longer than it can. They'll spend untold amounts of money trying to keep themselves healthier, looking younger, trying to maximize how long they're going to live on the earth. Except the Bible tells me that God put a number on every man's head. Doesn't matter what you do or what you don't do, you're going to live as long as God says you're going to live. Doesn't matter what diagnosis comes your way, if God said it's not their day, it's not your day. And it doesn't matter... All the things that you did to try and... If God says today is the day, today is the day that your life will be required. His ways are above our ways. I don't know why He gave the number that He did to each, but I do know that God is faithful and true and that no matter what the number, He gives every man an opportunity to come unto Him. What are you saying, Brother George? You can't work hard enough to make your enjoyment last longer than what it's going to last. You can't labor long enough to get more enjoyment out of a day. To get more purpose out of life. To find more satisfaction. To prolong your days or shorten your days. That Bible references who, right, by thinking, can add a cubit to his stature or take it away. You can labor all you want to, but a day is going to be a day. A night's going to be a night. And it's going to stay that way. Why? Because that's the way that God hung it out there. The only time that I find that things go different than the way that God framed this universe is like on that battle where Joshua was out there and God knew that if the sun went down that they'd be overtaken at night by their enemies. So he hung the sun up there for a few extra hours. Or the day that they crucified Christ. God blocked out the sun so that man wouldn't see the shame that had become his only begotten son. To hide the shame that he took upon himself for our sins and our iniquities. But unless God does the work, guess what? The sun's going up, the sun's going down, and it's coming back up in the same spot it did yesterday. Now they can spend all the money they want to trying to get to Mars. Ain't going to work. 
Because you know what God said? People live on the earth. God let us go to the moon, but God put a limit on how far man can go. And let me tell you, Mars is past it. It's folly. Well, if we get to Mars and one day when global warming, global warming ain't going to be the problem. Antichrist is going to be the problem and then global warming is going to turn into the fiery wrath of God and it's going to consume it all. Well, I don't know how we got off on all that, but verse number 6. The wind go toward the south, turneth around, turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. You know which way the wind blows? The way God says the wind needs to blow. In fact, the Bible makes a lot of comparisons between the Holy Spirit and wind. Because who can discern when God's going to move, how God's going to move, or you know, to what extent God's going to move? You, you know how to tell which way the wind's blowing? You open the window, you lick your finger, and you stick it out there. And then do it again a little bit later, and guess what? It may have changed. Weatherman may tell you, well, it's going to be a little windy today. Is it? It may be windy for a moment, but then it's not windy. Then it's windy all of a sudden again. But Solomon's trying to get the point across, it doesn't matter how hard you labor, you can't change certain things about this world. Ain't nobody from Adam until today that's been smart enough to figure out how to change the direction of the wind. Nobody's labored hard enough to be able to say, I want that tornado to stop. And it actually happened. I don't find that anybody on their own merit has gone out and stood before a hurricane and said, uh, flip that switch and then the hurricane go away. No, I mean, it was verse number 7. He says, all the rivers run to the sea. Yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again see I think Solomon knew a little bit about this thing called the water cycle that they taught me about in school water run downhill you know what's the lowest place of, well for water you know what the lowest place on earth is the sea that's why they always say sea level is how you measure things you don't measure it based off of the level that you're at because it may be flat where you are but flat the bottom is the surface of the water and then you got weird places like Death Valley where there's a big divot in it. Or New Orleans where they're like, let's build a city below the water. That's a good idea. Anyway. But where's the Mississippi run to? Gulf. Where's the Gulf go? Out to the Atlantic. But yet somehow God takes the water out in the Atlantic and guess where it ends up at? Back at the start of the Mississippi. Where's the Ohio run? To the Mississippi. Repeat process. Right. What flows into Ohio? The Allegheny. Go up to Pittsburgh. Right. Doesn't matter where you trace it. It all just flows out to the sea and it ends back up where it started. Right. If you can't change the simple things like that, what makes you think that any of your labor is going to allow you to change the way that God wants your life to work? You know why the sun comes up and the rain ends up back at the beginning of the Mississippi River? Why the wind blows one way and then the other? Because that's the way God willed it to happen. If you can't stop a river from flowing, in fact, that's why when they build dams, new lakes get formed. Because they can't stop the new water coming in. They've got to find a place to hold it until they can get it through that dam to make electricity. And it's one of them. One of the weirdest things. Water. I mean, it's just, it's simple. But it's wet. It's liquid. Right? And if there's nothing in it, you need it to live. But right? if there is stuff in it, you may still have to drink it depending on how thirsty you are. Okay, but water, they say half an inch of water, if it's moving quick enough and there's enough of it, will pick up any car and take it down the road with it. Something so shallow. Why? Because that's the way that God intended it. You can't stop water from going where God wants it to go. 
And if you try to get in the way of it, guess what? It takes you with it. All them people, they say, flood's coming. They say, ah, we'll be all right. Next thing you know, there's helicopters picking them up off the roof. What was their problem? They thought that they knew better than what God said was going to happen. And if that surprises you every time there's a hurricane and there's some idiot that said, no, I think our house is waterproof. Next thing you know, there's water up to the ceiling in the first floor and they're up in the, you know, either on the roof or the second story hanging things out the window. Hey, help, stuck. Every time that happens and you're like, man, how stupid are people? Just remember, the whole world didn't get on the boat with Noah. It's no surprise that they're still not willing to leave when somebody says, hey, danger's coming. Why? Because the sun goes up, sun goes down. Man's still just as stupid as man was. The Bible says, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of truth. What's that truth? It's not about what you can do. It's about what God can do for you. It's about what God can use you to do for Him. Then verse number 8 says, all things are full of labor. That means it doesn't matter which course you take, it's full of labor. If you desire something out there, or you desire something after a carnal fashion, you know what it's going to cause you to do? Work yourself to the bone. Doesn't matter what it is, it's full of labor, regardless of which way you take, regardless of which desire it is that you have. No wonder this world's going insane. They're killing themselves trying to find just some measure of satisfaction and happiness and peace in their life and everything that they try. They've been killing themselves for some 6,000 years now trying to find it. And no wonder they're willing to try crazy things because everything that's been tried before hadn't worked. I hate to tell them that all the crazy stuff they're trying now still isn't going to work. But when people get desperate, they do desperate things. This world is desperate. It's because of the desperation of man that man bought into the lie in the garden. Eve was desperate to be like God. She doubted that God said, you shall surely die. God, she doubted that God really meant that shall not eat of the tree of the night. Adam already messed up when he added to the word of God. He told her, Thou shalt not eat nor touch the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good or evil. But that desire, that in discontent deep down in the soul of man, it's still discontented today. It's still just as unsatisfied as it is today. Well, why do we go through all that, Brother Jordan? Because I want to help you point is we've got there's something down here that if it isn't filled you'll go crazy trying to fill it I've seen saved people make a mess of their life after a pursuit of what because they weren't satisfied with God anymore and they wanted to try and find something that would satisfy them or they thought that they could still keep one hand on God and go after this and what happened they became very discontented made a mess of their lives not just talking about lost people, talking about saved people too. Every day when you wake up, there is a hunger deep down here in your soul that desires to have fellowship with the Almighty. Now, I know we don't deserve it. I know that we can't merit it. But God made a way that we can do it, which means we can. God promised me that He made me a priest that I can enter directly into the throne room of God. And God sees me as if I was talking face to face with Him every time that I pray. God removed all borders, all boundaries. Why? So that we could be satisfied in Him. I mean, that verse number 7 says, All the rivers run to the sea, yet the sea is not full. That's a good description of the heart of man. As long as man's got a hole in his soul, doesn't matter how much water he pours in it, it's not going to fill up. A bucket with a hole in the bottom can never be full. Doesn't matter how much you shovel in there, it's not going to clog it. Not going to stop it up. Doesn't matter how much Bondo, right? how much Loctite, 
how much of that uh, plumber's tape you put around it, whatever you try to put in there, it's not going to stick. Solomon saying, thousands of years of people have learned that lesson, and yet people are still too dumb today to realize the only thing that's going to satisfy is what comes from God. You know what to fill that, that hole in your soul? God. Why do you think he said he sealed you with the Holy Ghost? So that your soul couldn't lose what he put in it. Which was himself. You know why you were satisfied the day that you got saved? Because you had God. You know why if you're satisfied today, you're still satisfied? Because of God. And you know why you're not satisfied today? If you're not satisfied... Because you've started searching after something other than God. Because godliness with contentment is great gain. But what's that godliness? That means I've got to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's not just talking about godliness being the recipient of God Himself. That's talking about God transforming us into what He desires us to be. You want to see a miserable person? See a Christian that doesn't want to yield and submit and become what God wants them to be. Somebody that's stubbed up on God and said, no God, I won't do that, they're miserable. And it's not God's fault. It's because the one that satisfied them, they said, I'm not interested anymore, and then they lost all their satisfaction. And you know what they'll do? They'll labor and work themselves to death trying to get it back but they can't earn it. They've got to humble themselves and submit themselves for a holy God and say, Lord, you was right and I was wrong. Make me into what you want me to be. But see, it's not just enough to be a recipient of what God gave you and be turned into what God wants you to be. It also says contentment. Each and every one of us, we've got to switch in our brain where either... We can turn it on and we can start looking at things that we don't have. Or we can turn it off and we can be real focused on what we already have. People always looking at the other pasture, they don't realize that the green grass on their side is good to use. Doesn't matter how green the grass is, cows still going to eat grass. Cows eat hay, which is dead grass. If it's alive, they're going to eat it. How do you know? Because they eat the dead stuff too. Right? God gives you what it is that you need because He promised to meet all your needs. But when you start thinking that, well, it'd be real nice to have that too, you don't need it. Do you really know what contentment truly is? Contentment is when you get to the place in your life that you realize God's going to take care of you. And you stop worrying about what you have and what you don't have, and you start looking at what others have and what others don't have you stop thinking about where your meal is going to come from because God's got that I'm content doesn't matter if God sends me one of them cattle off of a thousand hills or if he sends cat and knees by food's coming right? God's got that he's going to take care of it doesn't matter if it's filet mignon or Chinese food it's going to be good whatever it is when it shows up because God's sending it I'm content with what not only God's given me, but what God's done in my life. Because my soul desires to be right where He wants me to be. And as long as I'm in the will of God, that's enough for me. When you get to that point, you know what you start seeing? The needs of others. You know why the world today isn't impacted by the church? Because the church is too busy looking inwardly at themselves. You know why the first church at Jerusalem turned the world upside down? It's because each and every one of them went home and sold everything that they had and gave it to the church. And then the apostles, and then later the deacons, divvied it up as everyone had need. You know what that means? All their needs was taken care of. You know what they could focus on every day? They didn't have to worry about where their meal was coming from. They knew God had it. They wasn't worried about where their next you know, outfit was coming from. They knew God would send it when they needed it. They weren't worried about where they were going to stay. They knew that God had a place for them. You know what they were worried about? What other people didn't have, which is what they did have, Christ. 
You know why the world looks at the church and sees, I don't want what they have? Because they see that we're just as discontent with what we have as they are with what they have. The first step is godliness. The second step is saying, Lord, I've got enough faith to believe that if you had what it took to save me and to satisfy me, that you have enough to provide for me once you purchased me. But it'd be nice to have that car. Yeah, it would be nice. But just because it'd be nice doesn't mean that it's nicer than what God gave me now. You know what God gave me now? What I needed. And what you need is always nicer than something that doesn't exist. Well, it'd be nice to have an Armani suit. Yeah, but if you wore it, you'd be so afraid of people bumping into you or catching a stitch on a door somewhere, right? You'd be a nervous wreck. You'd be standing there like this because you didn't want to get wrinkles in it. I know it's true. I always get upset when I buy a pair of shoes and then they end up creasing in a way that doesn't look right on one side compared to the other. And it's my fault because I sit over there and I shake my leg like a jackhammer. Right? But always one of them doesn't. I'm like, ah, that doesn't look nice. But the shoe's still the shoe. I can still go out and walk around in them. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying you can either look at what you don't have, which there's a whole lot in the world that you don't have. You know why you don't have it? You don't need it. Because if you needed it, God promised that He'd give it to you. And if we're all honest, we've got a whole lot more than we need. Why? Because God just blesses us above all measure. But instead of understanding that everything I've got is a representation of the love and the grace and the mercy of God, and that's what the world needs, we're too busy looking at what other people have, what we don't have, and what's it caused us to do? Become dissatisfied with God. How can you be dissatisfied with the one that bought you with a price that no man could pay, then didn't make you a servant? No. He said you received the adoption of sonship. You wanted a family. He didn't just buy you. He promised that because he knows that we're liable to make a mess of things, like we did the first time around, which is why we needed a Savior, he said, now nah, don't worry about it. You're in my hand. My hand's in the Father's hand. No man can pluck you out of the Father's hand. Even if you tried to lose what it was that I gave you, you can't do it. Because I put it in your life, and I'm the only one that can take it out. And he promised he wouldn't. The only way you can lose your salvation is by doing what? Removing or adding to the Word of God. So don't mess with His Word. Guess what? you got eternal security. Don't start bastardizing the word of God and you're fine problem is we don't look at what we have we look at what we don't have and we lose that contentment the day you got saved you didn't want anything else in the world what happened the day that a great revival meeting happened we walk out thinking man there isn't anything in this world I would have traded for being here at the house of God tonight then three weeks later, bloodhounds can't find them. What happened? They lost that contentment. Contentment is a choice. Contentment is looking God in the face and saying, Lord, I know there's a whole lot out there that's nice and that may in esteem highly, but you can take it all away and I'd rather have you. Why? Because regardless of how much it costs, when you put it on, it's still just a suit coat or a dress. It's still just a car. It's still just a thing. It's vanity. It's empty. The true value of it is not what it does to you. The value is in how much it costs to make it. That's why it costs that much. The value is that uh, you can say, I have it and you don't. You know what that is? It's empty. It don't satisfy. So learn the lesson of those that came before us. Embrace God and say, Lord, that's all that I want. And you're all that I need. And with that contentment, your sh focus will shift from me to others. 
Because you know what you'll see if you take a look around the world? There's a lot of people that need him. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.